it's a house thing. It's a house thing. Hello, this is Let's Talk Property Radio Reverb 97.2 FM and DAB. I have a really interesting topic today and we have various people from Citizens Advice. We have uh, Brighton Housing Trust. We have James Duffy from Callaways and we have Mr. Peter Kyle, the Labour MP for Hove. So good afternoon, everybody. How are we all? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Kyle, if I could start with you, if I may. You brought to our attention in January a rather shocking story which hit the headlines. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about what Christopher Cox had got himself into trouble over? Yeah, I think you're referring to the issue of sex for rent. You know, what, what's happening is that people who are predators and sexual predators, what they do is they look for vulnerabilities in people and they have become experts in seeking out vulnerabilities in people and if we look at the light world as we find it today there are places like brighton and hove where there are very high property prices there is a shortage of availability there is a lot of young people coming into the city to study at universities and there is ubiquitous access to the internet via the mobile phones so we find there are some landlords out there who are advertising for free accommodation. Well, supposedly free accommodation, but there's a catch. And that's that you have to have sex with the landlord. This is a growing problem. It's been around for a while. Uh, and we're finding that uh, increasingly there are websites like Craigslist out there who are facilitating this transaction. In other words, they are profiting from the sexual exploitation, mostly of, of young people. Uh, so this is something which has, has uh, it is a, it is actually against the law, but there are lots of loopholes and there are lots of perverse incentives and there are lots of barriers to victims of sex for rent. Bearing in mind, three hundred thousand young people, mostly women, have been propositioned by this in the last year alone. There are lots of uh, disincentives and barriers to those people coming forward as victims and charges being brought and prosecutions being brought against the perpetrators. So I'm looking for enforcement uh, uh, to take place. I'm looking for a clarification of the law and a new offence of sex for rent to be created. And I'm looking for websites like Craigslist who are acting like pimps and should be treated like pimps. They should be brought to heel. I think the other thing, of course, is there are many online, for example, the gum trees. I'm not suggesting for any moment that gum tree is responsible for similar activity. But I think where myself and James and everybody here around the table today are concerned that there is the legislation in place to stop this sort of activity. So from there, what sort of measures would you like to see brought in on the legislative perspective? Well, it's really interesting you mentioned Gumtree because when when I was made aware of this from a, a a regional BBC journalist a few years ago, I immediately contacted both Craigslist and Gumtree, who are operating in the same space in the same market. Within a week of sending that letter on parliamentary paper, Gumtree, a director of Gumtree, had come to see me in my office in Parliament, sit down with me, and say, you know, talk me through it. You know, what what's the issue here? We had a very frank conversation, and he said, "What do you want me to do?" I said, start policing your site. Mm. You know, he was very, very concerned about this. And within a month of that meeting taking place, all of the adverts have been taken down from Gumtree. And Gumtree still to this day polices its website, specifically looking for sexual exploitation happening on its site. Craigslist has refused to even acknowledge any of my letters on parliamentary paper, my phone calls, my emails, and also that of any journalists from the BBC through to the Daily Mail, uh, and also, I believe, government uh, civil servants as well and government officials as well. So if they are operating in our economy, uh, they, have the, they have the gift and the pleasure and the privilege of having access to the British economy and to British consumers, what they can do is actually police their website, or they shouldn't be allowed to operate in the first place. It's the first thing. The second thing is that the law that's applying to young people, that's keeping young people uh, safe at the moment, is the 2003 Sexual Offences Act. And the criminal offence is, is incitement to prostitution. Now that means that if somebody falls victim to this, then technically in the eyes of the law, if the perpetrator is convicted, the victim becomes defined as a prostitute. Now, this is way outside the normal norms we expect from a, a sort of a, a relationship that, uh, the, that we associate with sex work. 
so, uh, so what we need to do is create a specific offence of sex for rent, because at the moment, young people who, who succumb to this, uh, th this awful relationship and this, this awful exploitation, they don't overwhelmingly perceive themselves as being prostitutes. So if they are to become legally defined as prostitutes, then it's a disincentive to prosecution taking place. And this is one of the barriers which perpetrators are exploiting. So we need a specific offence for sex for rent that prohibit that the means that victims can come forward without the concerns of it. Now, the, the, the bigger issue, obviously, is housing crisis we have here in, in Brighton and Hove. You know, CAB and many other campaigners have been fantastic advocates for reforming, particularly the private rental sector, which has become a predominant uh, feature of uh, the mainstream housing sector in Brighton and Hove. Uh, unforced uh, evictions, um, Section 21 notices, you know, these are the things that are underneath of one of the real driving forces which are creating a whole generation of people who are quite vulnerable to housing issues. And, and the outcomes of this are very diverse, from rough sleeping right the way through to young people being exploited by sexual predators. So the work that CAB are doing and this is a foundational piece of work, which is really uh, keeping or seeks to keep a really broad uh, cross-section of people safe from exploitation, destitution uh, and real real severe discomfort which we wouldn't want on any of the young people or anybody of any age which is living in 21st century Brighton and Hove. No you're absolutely right and I think the other point of course is a lot of young people might be quite naive as well uh, you know if you've never had to rent before who do you go to what is the legislation all about and and I think the point is is if you suddenly arrive in Brighton from outside you don't know the place how do you actually know that you're going somewhere safe if especially if you arrive late at night for example if you haven't got the the CAB offices aren't open you know you can't get hold of anybody Body. And it's sheer desperation sometimes, isn't it? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Um, and you've got the dual uh, problems of homelessness and then people perhaps who don't know anybody in, this, in the town and the city centre that make them take decisions that perhaps normally they wouldn't take. How long do you think this is going to take to resolve? I mean, homelessness has been a, an issue for, for centuries, hasn't it? So, you know, here we all are sitting around a table, more or less. Uh, what can we do about it? Where do you think the conversations should start? I think what, the point that you just made, I think, is an incredibly important one. There are many people from middle class families who are sending their kids off to university who are anticipating their children to have the same kind of experience at university that they had. And the, the thing that I, I'm very keen to impress on people is that when they read about sex for rent and sexual exploitation, people tend to believe that there is a stereotype of people who succumb to this type of exploitation. And it tends to be people from poorer backgrounds who aren't empowered, who aren't able to either see the signs or to uh, protect themselves when these sorts of predators come knocking. Uh, but actually what we're seeing here is a phenomena which actually uh, applies to people right across the socioeconomic background and different groups. So as you say, people coming into a city like Brighton and Hove at a point in their life when they're experiencing all these new freedoms, very often for the first time, it is exhilarating. They're experiencing geographical freedoms for the first time. They're experiencing relationship, emotional freedom for the first time. And yes, they're also experiencing sexual freedom and right at that moment, and intellectual freedom as well. And right at that moment, in, into this sort of heady mix comes this offer at a time when people might be really, really struggling to find accommodation. This sort of benign offer might, might cross their path and they might succumb to it. But once they're in it, and this is what the victim testimony says, it's very difficult, as you say, if you are in an exploitative relationship, living in a house where a man will be saying how many times a week he will want sex, what type of sex it is he wants, the kind of look and physical attributes that he wants. Once the person, uh, the victim is in the relationship, which might well appear quite sort of loose and free to start with, suddenly becomes very, very manipulative and very prescriptive about what people wear, how they act, what they say, and particularly the kind of sexual acts that they're to, they're to perform. And once they're in that relationship, damage is being done. And we're finding that it's very difficult for people to leave it because to leave that situation overnight 
to, is it almost impossible to find your way into another type of accommodation which is safe and secure because you don't have the deposit, you don't have the paperwork, you don't have the guarantors, all these things. And very often the victims to this don't want to appear on somebody's doorstep with a bag, an overnight bag, and say, can I sleep on your, your, on your couch? Because they don't want to explain to friends what's happened to them. So uh, perpetrators of this kind of exploitation, they know these vulnerabilities. They know how to exploit these vulnerab vulnerabilities. And I don't think there are enough parents out there that believe that they're kind of middle class, well-educated, empowered youngsters that they're sending off to university or sending off to another part of the, the country, just how vulnerable some of them are to this particular type of vulnerability. That's wow. why the law needs to change. Uh, it's very, very simple to create a new uh, to create a new uh, a, a, a new offence, but it's even more simple for the Home Office just to tell law enforcement agencies to start enforcing the law now. Placing the advert is a criminal offence with up to seven years in prison. Start locking people up. They were allowing a website to profit from these adverts, mm. profit from sexual exploitation. And it's been going on for years and the Home Office has done nothing about it. Do something, you could do it tomorrow if you wanted, if the will was there, the, well, the I'm trying to create is, the will. Uh, the, the trouble is licensing such landlords won't happen because they're always no. trying to find a fault with the law. So really what we're looking at is policing, as you say, either on the website, on Craigslist, on the online portals, um, just making sure that people who do complain about it, um, they're taken seriously. James, can I bring you in quickly about legislation for letting agents? You know, the sorts of risk assessments that as a letting agent we have to do on the landlord and the tenant. Could you just explain that very quickly? Yes, I mean, I was just listening to Peter and actually I think it goes across the whole of the private rented sector in terms of the actual enforcement that is the issue here, whether it be the examples that Peter's talking about or other aspects of the private rented sector. There is lots of legislation and lots of penalties and lots of consequences for people that are breaking the law and not providing safe homes for tenants and not providing the acceptable safety certificates. And yet there's just not enough enforcement. Um, there's more and more laws coming in but we need to have some teeth behind it and local authorities definitely need more funding and there needs to be some kind of I don't know whistleblowing situation where the professional people in the, in the industry who recognize that some of these activities are going on can actually feed it into someone and make it clear to the people in the industry how they can do that to try and crack down on them but if we as a professional letter agent are, are, are taking on clients I can only speak for myself. I've done the job 20 years and, you know, we, we go out and risk assess not just the client, but actually their property. I use a thing called a property MOT, which is not used up and down the country, but we use it to see what 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 the property, if it's safe to actually move, move people in. Um, and um, I have to say that I find that some clients end up not wanting to work with some professional letting agents. I mean, we get rogue letting agents, we get rogue, uh, rogue uh, landlords, and I, we do find that since there has been an in uh, more legislation, some landlords are, are walking away from professional letting agents and going and doing it themselves. And it worries me because that is another under the radar, under the carpet set of uh, landlords that are, are are actually, in some cases, not compliant to the safety uh, certificates and the HHSRS. And so if it's done properly, um, the compliance on the property and the landlord can work and as long as landlords want to be educated and tenants have got a safe environment and there is a mechanism for tenants to take landlords to task who aren't keeping their um, obligations and also letting agents if that is the case uh, where they're not complying and it is it is very frustrating for decent landlords and letting agents mm. where there is you know, a, a certain sector of, of, of the private rented sector that is, is really not raising the bar and it's giving everyone, everyone a bad name. And one final point I'd say here is that I think actually we have to be a bit careful. There's a, quite a lot of anger in the sector as well. And we need people to work together and not 
not worry about speaking. This is a brilliant forum. I mean, this is absolutely excellent. And I hope that we can continue similar forums like this with professional people across all of these different agencies, because there are some really good people that want to make a, a difference to the private rented sector and a healthy private rented sector. But we need to work together as opposed to working against each other. And it's some of the stories are absolutely scary and it, it really does need some some serious enforcement. Thank you, James. I think one of the things that I did, um, Alex, if I could bring you in here, you said there were 76 percent increase in issues reported about the private rented sector, which is is horrifying. Well, housing is one of our top issues and it has been for a long time. There have been increases in some areas because of the pandemic. Um, what with all the changes happening with legislation and pauses on eviction and things, much of which has been really welcome and has kept people housed. We've been doing some research on this matter. And just like James was saying, there's lots of areas of agreement right now to try and keep people safe, keep people housed. Um, some of that is about potentially a program of grants or loans that lots of us are calling for because lots of us are living on a reduced income now, whether that due, is due to being furloughed, getting less hours at work, um, whatever it may be. Um, but costs of rent in Brighton and Hove are very high. Our research um, showed the medium, median rent is about £700 for England. In Brighton and Hove, it's over £1,000. So us, the National Landlords Association, Shelter and other agencies have been calling on the government for a program of grants to support people whose income has been reduced due yeah. to the COVID crisis yeah. Yeah. to kind of stay off evictions. There's the biggest structural issues that we're talking about, about um, ending Section 21, as well as yeah. the high cost of rent. But there's real crunch times due to the pandemic at the moment as well that we you know, do need to look at. Just a bit of a break from the dawn. Um, Peter, I'm aware that you're going to have to leave us fairly soon. You know, every every little issue seems to end up we have to spend more money. Is there more money for the local authority, perhaps from government funding, that can be brought in to help people who are struggling? We've sort of gone a little bit off course here with the the landlords and the, the, the rather abominable landlords that we've heard about. But actually, if we want people to have safe properties to rent, and now we've just heard about how the median rent in um, Brighton and Hove is higher than the rest of the country, how do we go about providing grants? Is there money in the purse or not? We should say, actually, that there are some fantastic landlords out there and, and uh, you know, the, the housing campaigners and uh, are the first to acknowledge that actually, you know, we meet some people out there and the, pe the people who really, really want the market to be fixed and sorted and properly regulated and brought into line with modern standards of regulation are the really good landlords themselves because they are fed up of being tarnished by some other the really bad practice that there is out there. And the relationship between a tenant and a really good landlord is a crucial one. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when you say, is there money out there at the moment? No, because if you take a local authority like Brighton and Hove, that has a very high degree of, uh, of need, social need on its budget, we have one of the highest, uh, highest rates of adult social care and social care in general uh, for, for a city. And we have quite a low rate of uh, business tax being paid uh, back to the city. So uh, it's very difficult for us to generate the income that we'd like to invest in some of these things. And we've had our budget cut by over 50% uh, in the last decade. So all of these things makes it incredibly difficult. What we do have here in Brighton and Hove is the political will. Uh, what we don't have is either the freedom to regulate locally from central government, because central government has hoarded the powers to make the regulations, to regulate the market locally. Uh, uh, and we don't have the money from central government in order to invest to so either support the best landlords or to buy back some of the property and then convert it and use it in quite imaginative ways, or to do some of the other things that you're, you're, you're suggesting, which is local grant funding, local emergency supporting for individuals and so forth in crisis. But we do have the political will here. Uh, and, you know, I remember because when I was involved in writing the Labour Manifesto over the 2005 campaign locally, you know, we had in that some, <clears throat> some really interesting things about landlord registries and so forth. And, uh, and that, that, that still is operational, but it's very limited to certain parts of the city. 
But I remember the hoops we had to jump through. In fact, we had to find loopholes in the law, the, 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 na the na national legislation, in order to find a scheme that could work. And it has worked where it's been applied and used properly. But these are the things that actually government should be working with us on. And because this is so, um, you know, there are so many local characteristics, depending on the age of a town, the, the economy of a town or city, whether it's a university town or whether it's, uh, whether it's an industrial town, all of these things mean that local authorities should have a lot more power to shape and regulate the housing market, whether it's ownership, or whether it's private rented in a much more assertive way in the interests of the whole community itself, not just the interests of either the owners or the landlords. Thank you. Suzanne, would you like to come in on that? Hi, yeah, I'm Suzanne. I'm from Brighton Housing Trust. Um, it's really dreadful what Peter's been telling us about, about these young people. Uh, and they're not necessarily young people. They can be no. anybody who's single. Mm. Um, and, you know, even couples are, are pulled into this sort of um, thing that's going yeah. on, which is dreadful. But unfortunately, we're looking at a housing market that's broken. Um, and if I, you know, if we rely on the private sector as it currently is to provide secure housing for people, it can't. It's not a case of um, there are a lot of landlords that are really good. And really, people that want to live in privately rented accommodation, it suits their needs. It suits what they want to do. Mm. But for the most vulnerable people, this should be their home. This should be somewhere where they're safe. They can shut their door. They can do what they want, um, within reason, of course, the same as everybody else. Um, but the, the private rented sector for the most vulnerable doesn't seem to be like that. They can't afford to live there in the main because the, the local housing allowance doesn't cover the rent. And of course, the other problem with the private rented sector is generally you have the a six month AST for starters. Mm. Now, I know there are discussions about having a three year tenancy, but equally that doesn't meet everybody's needs. You know, James, we have quite a lot of turnover in tenancies, don't we? You know, people who come for the universities, maybe they'll stay for three years, but they go home in the summertime and in all the holidays. So three years doesn't suit everybody. So surely, uh, Peter, we should be having not just fixed tenancies of, say, three years, there should be more of the shorter ones as well. So these young people who come for two or three nights, you know, there is somewhere for them to go which is safe and it's somewhere that's cost effective and they're free to come and go as they please oh i couldn't agree more but you see this this is the thing that we always talk about when we talk about uh the right to secure uh, tenancies is that if you have the right to a three-year or 10-year or an indefinite tenancy it doesn't mean you have to stay for three years or five years <laughs> or ten years it just means you have the right to but I, this is flat i'm talking to you from now i've lived here since uh 2000 so I've lived here now for, you know, 20 years, coming on 21 years in this flat. It's changed a lot as I've sort of had, had you know, been able to invest in it and do renovation work in it and so forth. But it means I've seen a lot. And, you know, outside my flat here in the street, there are trees all, all the way down now in Lansdowne Place, which is great. They're sort of nice, mature trees. Well, uh, I, I help plant those trees. You know, that's the point about living in a community and knowing you're going to be in this community for a while. And it doesn't, it shouldn't just be that people who are owner occupiers have a feeling of security and a feeling of commitment, not just a commitment to the, to the house, because this house was built in the 1820s I'm in. There's now eight flats in it. But when I bought it, everybody was owner occupier. Then it went down to two people owner occupier. And you see the difference in the, in the communal hallways it, where, when it is people on very, very short or, or no notice contracts uh, and they're quite small flats therefore people you know moving in in couples but, but moving out as soon as they can they don't invest in they don't feel a commitment to the to the house let alone the community we need people who are uh, who feel secure uh, and they're able to you know because people who have security can plan families uh, can plan livelihoods can plan into the future you know, they can actually invest in the in their own property in the broader property in the co and the community around them you know, so, you know, would I have planted trees if I was if I thought I'd only been here for six months? You know, almost certainly not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the sorts of things which are really important, not just for individuals. And this is a thing I think all of us are trying to say 
it doesn't just give individuals freedoms and rights and security. It does so for a whole community. Uh, you know, we all benefit when we have a group of people who are actively investing, not just in physical things, but investing in getting to know our neighbours, supporting our neighbours in times of difficulty, knowing the signs of when community members and neighbours are, are in trouble or might in stress or might need you know, an extra hand or a knock at the door. You know, these are the things we should be su striving for as a whole community. And isn't it absurd that we're trying to do so against the direction and ability and the legislation created by central government. You know, we should be we should be swimming, you know, you know, with the tide with them. But at the moment, we are swimming against the tide by simply trying to create the stability and security that individuals and community needs to become more healthy. No, absolutely. I mean, we're all in agreement, aren't we? I mean, it's great to see everybody saying, yes, 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 we agree, we agree. But actually, it doesn't move us any further forward in, in finding how we can manage these issues of homelessness and evictions and tenancy length, etc. So where do we start from? Can I can I speak to Nigel now? Nigel, are you on... Um, are you on speaker? I'm now on speaker, yes. Oh, lovely. Good Thank afternoon. you. So, yeah. Hello, Nigel. I've, I'm um, speaking to Nigel Parkinson, yes. Yes, and I, I, along with Sue, I work at Brighton Housing Trust. I mean, I just really want to endorse what Peter and James and everybody else has been saying on the panel. Um, there is certainly a need to encourage a professionalism within the private rented sector. I mean, that's undoubted. There is a lot of goodwill and we need to in, enhance that. And obviously that does involve a lot of partnership working, but we've actually got to kind of raise those standards. And what Peter was saying, and indeed what James was saying, is that there is actually a lot of legislation out there, but we are actually inhibited from using it from by central government. And central government is the one with the purse strings and central government's purse strings are so tight that local authorities with the will, such as Brighton and Hove, cannot actually exercise the legislative options that are available because they just don't have the resources. So we've got to create a culture. And I also think we've got to encourage a greater understanding of what the issues are. And so not only at the extreme ugly end of the phenomenon that Peter was talking about in terms of Craigslist, but actually the fundamental imbalance in our you know, the housing structure where there is such a dearth of supply um, and such high demand, especially in cities like Brighton and Hove, and yet there is just inadequate housing. There's inadequate housing across the board, but in particular, there is inadequate social housing. And what Sue was saying earlier on is very pertinent because there was a time when people with vulnerabilities and complex needs were essentially housed by the local authority. That doesn't happen anymore. What happens is the private sector becomes the default sector. And many landlords, you know, are they're not equipped to be social workers. You know, sorry, many, many private landlords, they're not equipped to be social yeah. workers. Why, you know, that's not what they set out to be. And yet that's actually sometimes what they end up having to be. And so that in itself is a major problem. But I think, you know, we've got to create, create a greater understanding. We've got to actually use the resources that we've actually got. And I do think we have to campaign for some legislative, fundamental legislative changes because Section 21 does militate against an emotional investment in your community, as well as obviously a physical investment, because if you can't plan to be there, if you can't plan where you're going to be in six months time or 12 months time, you can't work out where the school is going to be, where your GP is going to be, you know, sometimes even in terms of, you know, where, where your work um, is going to be, um, because you don't have secure routes. And that does not actually create a good community feeling. And then I think we will pay for the problems later on. I certainly know that since the uh, start of the pandemic last year, you know, of all our landlords, a lot of them don't want six month ASTs. They want longer. They don't want the void periods. They're very happy for tenants to stay. They're very happy, very often families to come in. What, what's and, an AST? Oh, sorry, an assured short-haul tenancy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's an agreement. I'm sorry, oh, there's me talking, Mike. <laughs> you know, and they're 
therefore, it does make sense that there are longer tenancies. But equally, we do say to landlords and tenants alike, if you agree on a longer tenancy, maybe 6, 12, 24, 3 years, and then after that, it becomes a deed rather than an AST, an assured shorthold tenancy. So again, you've got different sort of classifications of the te types of tenancies that exist. And, you know, when you first move to Brighton and Hove, you don't know whether you're going to like it or not. Do I want to stay here? Do I want to move up the ladder? You know, we have lots and lots of overseas students that come over as well. So we are trying to house a complex demographic, actually, lots of different demographics which all require different requirements. And that is a tough call to make. You know, I really wouldn't have, have to plan all of that. Equally, we are seeing more buildings going up, build to rent. So we have got the facility to do it. But here we are. We've only got three sides to Brighton and Ho. We don't spread into the sea, you know, despite the Brighton Marina side. Maybe we need another Brighton Marina to build more houses. But I think it's a very difficult case to answer that some landlords are not doing what they should be doing. Delilah, I'm speaking to Delilah Dumont now. Delilah, do you think we should be, look, you, you're on the research side, aren't you? What do you find about legislation and tenancies? Um, yeah, just to sort of acknowledge the pause on evictions that we have going on at the moment, which are, have been extended again and are due to lift on the 31st of March. Yep. Um, I think what what the kind of constant extension is doing is delaying the inevitable, which is sort of tackling these rent arrears, which aren't going anywhere. Um, people are still on furlough. People, there are more people going on benefits. The, from analysing the data, I've noticed how kind of the issue of rent arrears in the private rented sector um, intersect with employment, debt, health issues, um, things like that. So um, another thing that Citizens Advice is sort of suggesting um, that the government does is um, introduce greater discretion for judges when eviction proceedings begin again to assess how each case has been um, affected by the pandemic, um, which as it stands wouldn't wouldn't be the case. A judge wouldn't be allowed to assess, take into account whether um, a defendant's income had been affected by the pandemic. So yeah, I think a more intersectional understanding, as as I'm sure we all kind of agree on, needs to be implemented at that level. Sure. Now, Alex, I think you have some statistics or some case studies which shows that people being homeless, a homeless person costs a whole lot more than actually providing funding to keep a letting going. Is that is that correct? I have some stats here about kind of average people's rent arrears and what a, what a grant could be given towards that. So we know that at the moment, um, I think one in three private renters are on a reduced income due to the coronavirus. We know that the average of those people with rent arrears is about over £700. And over half of those people, a £600 grant would be enough to lift them out of arrears. I don't have the figures to hand, but we know as workers in housing in Bryant and Hove, the cost of um, people uh, roof sleeping, of emo emergency housing, of temporary accommodation, and in Brighton and Hove, um, funding for that has increased massively to keep people housed during the pandemic, which has been incredible. But as Delilah says, what we need to do now is think ahead for this kind of debt crisis and rent arrears crisis that's going to be coming up and that's been pushed back and pushed back. And that's wonderful because it's kept people housed. But we've got landlords on a reduced income looking for those rent payments and we've got tenants increasing in debt with resultant mental health issues. And that's what we're going to be needing to look, in at, really, to look at really, really soon. Just very quickly, mm -hmm. because there's been a lot of talk in our country at the moment about levelling up. Uh, but the fundamental problem with our economy for a generation now has been if you, if, you, if you have asset, you are going to succeed in life. But if you're born into a family that has assets, you're going to succeed in life. But assets as in you know, a property, you own a property, you own you know, savings, you own stocks and shares. But if you're if you are talent rich but asset poor and born into that family, you're not going to succeed. And what we've seen during this crisis is that people who own properties and have mortgages are given you know mortgage holidays and they're sort of you know encouraged to to, to survive through it. But people who are in tenancy, their debt just stacks up and up and up and up and up and is overwhelming them. And so we're going to come out of this not just with you know going into this, we went into it where people who owned assets we're doing better than those who didn't because people who earn, who rely on waged income 
have seen their, their overall income suppressed now for the last 25 years. And those who have assets that are earning their income have seen, uh, seen it increasing, you know, uh, in, 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 in uh, above inflation quite, quite extraordinarily high. Uh, the, the sort of that, that inequality has been exacerbated by COVID. And that is something we're going to have to really address. And it's no, it's not going to be acceptable to come out of this and accept uh, and expect people who are in ten- tenancies and private rental sector to shoulder enormous amounts of debt going forward and those who are owner occupiers just to carry on basically as they were before uh, and heather I- i'm sorry I-, I have to leave now i'm afraid because i'm oh, no. a-, a live uh, <laughs> meeting now I- i'm really sorry but this is a it's a fascinating conversation and, and I-, I would love as you can imagine to, to stay and listen to well, well thank you for joining us and hopefully we can get another panel going because I think it's been a very lively so. discussion, but yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you, you to bye. you and everyone else. Take care, bye. bye. Could I just come in there, Heather? I mean, yes. um, I absolutely um, recognise that um, this the tenant rent arrears situation is scary and we are the lane of the eviction is just putting off a very difficult situation that's coming in front of us. But I do worry that we're, we are looking at one problem, which is the eviction and the tenants arrears. We need to look at this a lot more holistically because we've already identified, Susan said it earlier on, there is the absolute need for social housing and we haven't got a social property rented, whatever, and we haven't got it. Landlords, Peter said that they can take payment holidays. Well, actually, that isn't a freebie. They are stacking up their mortgage debt if they've got a mortgage. I appreciate some don't have mortgages. So we need to make sure that tenants don't come out of this with loads of debt. We need to make sure that landlords feel that they've you know, had some kind of support to some extent through this, because what we don't want is even more landlords leaving the sector putting great oh, pressure yeah. on the on the market in the absence of social housing so that area worries me because we need to make sure that we need to have a healthy private rented sector and that does require having landlords in that as well as tenants not feeling their burden with loads of debt and have the worry of being evicted and and in terms of length of tenancies i mean i've done the job 20 years and i have to say i can count on one hand where i've dealt where i've personally dealt with a landlord that wants an unoccupied property and wants a void they want to keep keep high occupancy they don't want to be in my experience but obviously i appreciate i deal with us in a certain type of market that they they actually don't they do want to keep their tenants in there generally and we have to deal with the landlords that are doing reality revenge evictions because of things that there's a mechanism to deal with those people but um i did an exercise probably about two years ago because like landlords and like professional letting agency and for specifically tenants it's not in anyone's interest for tenancies to keep churning and people keep moving out it's in no one's interest at all so we took a, a stance as a, as a team as a company to speak to all of our landlords and say right when your next renewal comes up uh, your tenant was in there initially for 12 months when we approach the tenants if you want to renew why don't we offer them a 24 month contract and see give them more security and uh, i can i can fly, i can count on one hand the landlords that said no to that because they had a plan of selling the property through just pure uh, you know lifestyle change but mo- near, the rest of them all said, yep, yeah, I'll be happy to do that because I want longevity. I'm happy. Uh, we were really shocked, actually, the amount of tenants that actually said to us, oh, no, I don't want to commit to, to 24 months. In fact, I'd like to go on a stat periodic. And they didn't want another fixed term. Now, I'm experienced enough to realize it depends what market you place work in and you know we probably at that time didn't have loads of houses with families that had roots and people at school so it does depend who we're looking at here but I was quite shocked that the tenants wanted that a little bit more flexibility rather than these longer tenancies but the beauty was they had the option to have that which is really healthy Um, and I like the fact that the house to rent guy that the government produces you know does make tenants even ask the question they can have longer tenancies all these things are good but i do worry that sometimes i'd like sometimes i I personally would like to know a little bit more about the stats because um because i think some of the people that are in the private rented sector like i think um nigel touched on earlier are are, shouldn't be in the private rented sector and 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 some of the complaints that come through because the way they're being treated is because they are not being looked after by the right people because they should be in another sector uh because they've got vulnerability needs and that that sort of sometimes escalates some of the stats of the problems of the private rented sector. Radio Reverb. I probed into its mysteries. Every clue told me a different story. Radio Reverb. 
I mean, are there any kind of sponsorships that will help homeless people or people in vulnerable situations? For example, how how they could how people could sponsor a room or teach life skills or get counselling. You know, I mean, we are talking here about people in communities, as as Peter quite healthily spoke about. You know, we are in a community, and it's not just all about housing. So people who I keep going back to the story that we started off with with these this vulnerable person, you know, landing up with a landlord who clearly was not suitable as a landlord. But how can we better help our young people? And and Sue was saying it's not always young people. Others who, who have been homeowners and lost all their money and lost their home, they might be now entering the private rented sector. How do we actually help them as a community? Can I go to you again on this from the citizens' advice? Um, you absolutely can. I mean, it is so hard to get into the rental market because the cost of deposits are really really high you need to have certain documents like a passport which itself is over a hundred quid uh you need a guarantor or six months rent in advance so again the high costs and the barriers to entry make young tenants and vulnerable tenants exploitable what we have been saying is that at the moment like james was saying some people want some tenants want flexibility because they don't know where their work is going to be in six months time so a longer tenancy might not suit them but what we've got at the moment is tenants are able to be evicted if they pay their rent if they're within the terms of the agreement a section 21 notice can just be issued and they have to leave although they've followed all the terms of their agreement whereas a tenant within a fixed term they have to stay there even if they lose work and can't afford things can't afford the rent anymore so that needs looking at we've been calling for the government to push forward on their renters reform bill to get rid of section 21 so that people can't be evicted if they're paying their rent if they're keeping to the terms of their agreement and to look at some of these things we've been saying like flexibility or being able to move and having a deposit um, that stays with you so you don't need to save up two thousand pounds plus here in brighton and hove every time you need to move no absolutely and and i think we have lots of conversations about this in the office don't we james about if somebody can afford a rent and a deposit they can probably also afford a mortgage if they had the right, if they met the, the right criteria because renting is very often far more expense than renting that's right. Suzanne, what sort of advice would you give somebody who arrived and perhaps didn't know where to start? Well, it's very difficult, Heather, to, to I think for somebody, sometimes people do have to leave situations where they are and they just have to go. There, There is no, they can't stay where they are. So to just, I would strongly advise somebody to not just leave their home unless they absolutely have to. That would be my strongest advice to anybody. But if somebody had to come and, and had to to leave and they ended up in in Brighton and they had very little money available to them I would suggest that they contacted Brighton and Hove City Council they have they'll have somebody even overnight they have to have a duty scheme where somebody they can actually contact somebody to speak to this about their situation then um, they could look at contacting if it was during the day the early intervention team at Brighton and Hove City Council who would then be able to give them advice they could contact ourselves, Bright, uh, Brighton Housing Trust or the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, and then um, if they ended up street homeless, which heaven forbid, we wouldn't want that for anybody, um, Mungo's actually runs a street outreach. And so they would be able to sort of speak to somebody if they were get to get into contact with somebody. But for us, everything is about prevention, Heather. Mm -hmm. We really don't want people to be street homeless and to become that vulnerable. Even speak to the local authority where they live before they just come to somewhere like Brighton, because unfortunately there is a local connection rule that people then have to fulfil as well. And some projects have that and they won't be able to work with them if they're not locally connected. And they would look at actually sort of helping them to return back to where they do have a local connection. Brighton and Hove City Council would have to process any statutory duties they have to somebody who is homeless and in priority need. But eventually they could end up being returned back to where they, well, having to return back to where they came from. Are we asking for the impossible? I mean, the, we've, we've all had good ideas that have put forward. We all seem to have the answers yet. 
that does not, that's not possible for each and every stakeholder to say, well, yes, actually, I think that's a good idea because we know there are so many complex issues within Brighton and Hove. So can I just go round you all and see if we are asking the impossible? Nigel, can I start with yourself? Yeah, I, I actually think that's a very good question. And the answer is, I don't think it is. We only have to look across to our neighbours to see that other societies have actually got a better balance than we have at the moment. Their levels of home ownership aren't quite to the same degree of ours, but there is greater security in the private rented sector. The private sector rented sector tends to flourish it's well managed there's lots of professional investment and but also then for the tenants there is actually a degree of security of tenure and also crucially there is adequate social housing and i think the biggest problem that we've got other than the lack overall of accommodation um, in the country but particularly in the southeast and particularly in brighton and hove is a lack of housing and a lack of social housing. And if we can do something to encourage the building of housing and the building of social housing, then what we are going to be left with, hopefully, is a more thriving private rented market. Because then the needs of those who want to go to the private market and emphasis on those that want to go can be addressed. Whereas those who end up there they don't really want to end up there because they want to be or need to be or should be housed somewhere else and not being addressed. And so, no, I don't think it is. I actually think it's a a failure of, in fairness, successive governments over the years to not adequately invest in the, the building of housing. I think I was trying to prepare for this last night, and I think I read somewhere <laughs> that it was back in 1971 that there was, if you like, the last amount of adequate building. And since then, there's been a, you know, perpetual decline. And obviously, I think, you know, there have been specific measures such as the selling off of council housing and things like that, which at the time may have seemed like a sensible thing to do. But we're now paying the price for it um, because we do not have sufficient social housing. And so where do people go? Oh, well, they try and go to a landlord, many of whom are very good many of whom aren't. And what happens is that we then, in desperate situations, end up with the scenarios that Peter was talking about at the beginning of the programme. So yeah. I think, I don't think um, it's asking for the impossible. OK, thank you. Uh, Delilah, you're in research. What's, what is your opinion? Uh, yeah, I was, I was just skimming through some of the case notes sort of before, um, before this conversation. And something that really struck me was... Um, just the complete lack of trust between tenants, letting agents, landlords, um, and a lack of awareness that tenants had about certain rights, certain access to advice um, that does exist. But I think because this balance has existed for so long, um, communication isn't that healthy between those three parties. And it is a, a public health imperative, the home, the advice is stay at home. And I think that it should be treated as seriously as that advice is being um, treated by, you know, everyone in the UK. And as Nigel said as well, you know, there are, there are people that are kind of edged into the private rental sector that maybe shouldn't be there. And some people that are excluded from access to the private rental sector by nature of their immigration status, their benefit status, even though there was the landmark judgments last summer, I think, about um, the no DSS policies. But I think it's going to take time for people's perspectives to catch up with those changes. So yeah, I think it's it's going to be hard, as you say, you know, um, but it is possible and we should make it so. Thank you. James, you're you're in the firing line with all this with the landlords and tenants and PRS. I mean, I, I don't think it's impossible. I, I, I agree with Nigel that there is some really good examples in other countries that I've got this working and they've got the balance right. In this country, there's some really good work being done. There's a professor at, called Julia Rugg at York University and the Nationwide Foundation Group who are really doing a lot of work about a better private rented sector. And to be honest with you, I don't know how many housing ministers we've had. There's no, hey, consistent, there's, there's no consistency. I mean, it should be <laughs> way up there on the priority. And, and actually, I don't think it should always be changing when the, when, when major governments change because it's just it's just 
too much for uh, of a brief to keep changing. And actually, I think we need a minister for the private rented sector, not just for housing. It's so complex and unique that we need we need a different approach to this. And you know, quite I am beyond frustrated because there is there is models there is models that work. There is answers. The answer isn't pushing everyone to the private rented sector. And I agree the private sector would flourish for the right people and why the social sector is right for other people. I mean, I am also have an interest in the build to rent sector, which you talk, spoke about earlier, Heather. And that is very much around communities. Whole buildings are built just to rent out. They've got lots of social interaction. They're building uh, communities within there. But and I actually think a lot of money is, seems to be being pumped into this, this sector, which is fine for, for, for whoever wants to live there, but they're incredibly expensive. They're, this is not the answer to the private rented sector's problems. And there seems to be a, a lot of that building going on. And it's right for whoever wants to be there, but it's not right for the whole sector. We need to be looking at other things. So if we could have more di discussions with people like us, and, and as Peter and other people have said earlier, that local local areas can pick up local issues and make, make decisions Positively, I mean, I did notice very briefly to finish off there. There was, um, I think it was Norfolk, Norfolk and Suffolk Council in January did a, a, a virtual meeting inviting all of their landlords and also their letting agents to a forum to uh, help educate them on on not just the needs of the finance of the private rented sector, but what grants and finances were available to both tenants and landlords, so that they can basically all get the best they can that's what is available. We know it's not always enough so that they were educated and, and uh, were able to keep tenancies together during this really difficult time and I think more of that needs to happen there needs to be less them and us and actually get around the table with sensible people and look look wider afield of what's working that's enough. Thank you James. Suzanne can I come to you now? Thank you Heather. Um, I think we're all agreed that we you know we can do this if we work together um, I think if there's if there's a will and there's a political will, um, if there was one that wanted to sort this problem out, it would. It's been shown uh, during the pandemic that everybody was in, everybody was housed. So let's put some of that into providing a housing sector that meets the needs of the people that need housing and keeping people safe. Thank you. I'm not going to put my my uh, thoughts forward. I've got lots of them, as you can imagine. Um, I've been a landlord for over 30 years, so I've seen a lot of ups and downs during those years as well. Um, Alex, what about yourself? Is there a way out, some shape or form? Absolutely. I mean, this is a crisis, both the pandemic and the housing crisis, and a crisis level response is needed, as there has been in some areas like furloughing and things like that. We need that in the private sector now to keep people housed. The political will is growing. Private rental matters have increased, uh, something we talk about in the political landscape for the last few years. We've got unions emerging and people talking about um, security and tenants rights. So I think that's going to continue. But we need to keep talking about it now all together, like James and everyone here says, to get action really soon. So really, it's setting out the pointers, isn't it? It's all very well talking, but I think there's a strategy to be had going forward that you just tick it off as you go through it. And it's not going to be simple. You know, a lot of people have lots of different needs. Brighton and Hove in itself, as I said earlier, has huge differences in demographics. You know, we've got brand new housing, we've got old listed buildings. So it, clearly there's an awful lot of work to be done. I can't believe this hour has just whizzed by. Isn't that unbelievable? You know, we've had a really good discussion Discussion. I'm sure we've only scratched the surface of some of the things we wanted to say. <laughs> Heather, before we go, could I just briefly say something to the to the, to the panel? Just sure. because I don't just I don't know if everyone is aware, but there is some work being done. I'm I'm on a working party uh, to do with uh, UPRN codes, uh, which are used within local authorities, and there's work being done where um, this is to deal with potentially rogue 
listings and rogue landlords that are all tied into land registry, local authority, planning applications, meter utilities, council tax bans, and each property has got this UPRN. And what the what we're looking to try and get through, and we're, we're obviously get, the, the the group has written to government and uh, the housing uh, secretary, is that. If we can get to a stage where each property from a from a from a private rented sector landlord's perspective has that unique reference number and then it can go on the property listing and people can then see that that property is compliant with the gas safety, the electrical, the relevant license that's to do with it's a HMO. Also, uh, tenants can be sure that that's, that that landlord is legit. And if there's any listing without it, it should be a flag up to the tenants that really you need to be watching not to really engage or not pass any money across. And it, it would bring together all of these compliance issues that we are not sure if the landlord is actually uh, a rogue or, or not. And it would it would encourage other landlords that are doing it good to feel that all the work they do is right and, and they're going to be, um, you know, compliant. So listen out for it. I'll talk to you all again about it. <laughs> There's lots of uh, lots of people working on it. And I think it doesn't deal with it. It doesn't deal with the debts. It doesn't deal with the evictions. I, I'm, I'm not saying that, but we're also dealing with trying to deal with rogue landlords, vulnerable people and unsafe properties. And this is a, a, an opportunity to make uh, properties you know, visibly, visibly to everybody more compliant. Well, thank you for that, James. I'm not sure that deals with the Craigslist um, issue, but at least it's a step no. in the right direction. I would like to finish off now by thanking all of you for joining me this afternoon. My guests today have been Peter Kyle, MP, Alec Brining, Operations <laughs> Manager at uh, Citizens Advice in Brighton and Hove, Delilah Dumont, who's Research and Campaigns Volunteer at Citizens Advice Bureau, Sue Hennell, who's Senior Manager at Brighton Housing Trust Advice Services, and Nigel Parkinson, a solicitor at Brighton Housing Trust. So thank you. I'm Heather Hilda Darling on thank Let's you. Talk Property. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a house thing. It's a house thing.